Welcome to the Apartment Investor Show, where we help you get smart and invest smarter in multifamily real estate. I'm your host, JC Castillo, founder and managing principal of the Multifamily Property Group. And joining me as always is my good buddy, my co-host, also known as the godfather of lending, Mr. Paul Peebles, national underwriter for Old Capital Lending. Polly, how are you doing today? JC, we are doing great here in Dallas, Texas. As you know, Old Capital is a, a national, a nationwide lender. And so we keep our, our finger and our thumbs uh, on the pulse about what's going on with financing apartment buildings throughout the nation. So I'm very excited about this podcast today because we had this gentleman speak at our uh, conference last year. Uh, we had probably about 750, 800 people that came to that conference. And he was kind of the, the headliners that we wanted to brag a little bit about him. And so uh, he took the stage by himself and, and kind of spoke to everybody that was uh, talking about apartment investing because I, I, I put a lot of, uh, of quality uh, thought uh, behind Jeremy and we're excited to have him on the podcast today. So I'm going to let you introduce one of my friends. Uh, go ahead, JC. Absolutely, Polly. And you know what? Uh, today, for all you listeners out there and all you viewers, we are so excited because today we're going to talk about something that's very relevant for all of you investors out there looking to put your hard-earned money into these apartment properties. We're going to talk about the top things you must do before investing in a real estate syndication. Folks, I cannot stress how important you need to do your homework on your hard-earned money and where you're putting it with these multifamily real estate investments. As you know, Polly, we talk about it all the time till we're blue in the face and we're gonna keep talking about it. We do not like to hear information from talking heads. We like to get our information straight from the experts. And Polly, as you rightly pointed out, this guy took your stage, 700, 800 people, and he is more than qualified to be up there speaking in front of people from an expert perspective on what it takes to be a successful passive investor. Let me just read off a couple of stats about our guest. Uh, this person that's coming to us has uh, 18 plus years. That's 18 years of investing as a passive investor. Okay, that's not sponsoring deals. I'm talking about putting his own hard earned dollars into real uh, multifamily syndications. He's invested himself personally in over 100, get that 100 opportunities. He's currently invested in 70 opportunities across more than $1 billion of real estate and business assets. Folks, he doesn't just do multifamily. He invests in many different things. He is a very uh, astute investor who has diversified uh, with his asset portfolio. He's the co-founder of Four Investors by Investors, uh, which is a, a meetup group or a nonprofit organization with over 30,000 members. I believe they are the single largest, if I'm not mistaken, uh, investor group in the state of California. He is the founder and president of the Roll Investment Group, where he manages over 1,500 investors uh, that are seeking uh, passive cash flowing investment opportunities. And by the way, just for kicks and giggles, he's also the advisor and advisor for Realty Mogul, which is one of the largest real estate crowdfunding websites uh, in the United States. Um, and he also has an MBA uh, from the Wharton uh, Business School. Guys uh, and girls who are listening, you're in for a real treat. Please welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Jeremy Roll. Jeremy, thank you so much for, for, for joining us today. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, guys. Really appreciate it. Very much looking forward to this. I think we're covering an important topic today. So thanks for having me. We, we definitely are covering an important topic. But before we get to our topic, Jeremy, you know, something that's really kind of at the top of our minds right now, and you and I and Paul were talking about this uh, before the show started recording, we were talking about the, the state of the market and what is happening right now. And, and I just wanted to give uh, you a little bit of a chance to kind of Give our listeners out there a peek into your perspective on what's happening. You know, today we just had a, a big announcement, unexpected announcement from the Fed. Uh, they cut interest rates uh, by half a percent and, and the stock market is actually not reacting well to it. And, you know, Jeremy, I want to get it from you. What do you think this all means in terms of being a successful passive investor in real estate? Yeah, this is a, it's a really interesting day that we're talking about this. It's actually great timing because... I'm not sure this is accurate, but I do believe this could be the first time since 2009 that the Fed has actually cut rates and the stock market is actually going down. And so we may be witnessing the end of this like 
everybody just keep buying the dip and just keep buying because it's going to go up forever mentality. And that could have huge implications, not just for the stock market, but everything just trickles over to other type of asset classes, the economy, et cetera. So that's a huge thing to watch uh, from an investor perspective. And, you know, JC and I were talking about this, but like the three of us were talking about this before, that some people are now looking to shift to uh, real estate. I just heard this from these guys today. I heard it in another conversation yesterday, how people are now maybe thinking about real estate, get out of the stock market, go to real estate. But the reality is that that doesn't necessarily, you know, not necessarily the best idea either because the real estate is not immune um, and certainly most asset classes are not immune to a downturn. Uh, and it's a whole domino effect that can happen. So we can get into that if you like too. But I think that watching what happens here with the stock market, are we really going to start to see a bigger decline going forward now? That's a huge, has huge implications, not the least of which from an investor perspective means that investors will likely get scared if their portfolios are down 10, 20, 30, 40% they not only will have less money to invest, but they get scared, which is actually, in my opinion, a very good thing for us trying to find opportunities. Uh, but, you know, the implications of that need to be understood as well. There's a lot of things we could talk about today, a lot of things going on. Uh, JC, what's your take on the supply chain economics? I mean, you're a high tech guy and you've been following this for a while. And when people don't come in to show up their, to their jobs in China or Indonesia or the Philippines or whatever, uh, the low cost provider is and and they, they can't make the product and they can't ship it and that can't be assembled here in the United States or even distributed in the United States. And what's the, what's the big picture that you're seeing? Yeah. I mean, I, I, you know, look, I think what's more, what's most important here, and this is such an exciting conversation guys, I real I'm really appreciating it is number one is that, you know, look, uh, you, you can't be a, a sky is falling type of person the same way that you can't be, uh, you know, everything is always going to go up, right? So two, sometimes two things can be equally true. And I think that's the case. Right now, it's really critical for all you listeners and viewers out there that you have, you're fundamentally, your head screwed on straight in terms of how you're approaching your investment uh, portfolio. You should be diversified across uh, stocks, bonds, and other assets like real estate. And, and you should also be focused on long term if you can do it. Um, look, people are not going to make uh, double their money in real estate in the next two years. It's not going to happen. It, it might have happened last decade. Uh, consider yourself lucky if you participated in that run, but it, it's not going to happen uh, uh, any time in the foreseeable future. This is going to all be all about chasing a very reasonable yield for the minimal amount of risk that you can, you can, you can stomach. And that's what it's going to be about. And it's going to be about looking to the long term. We're talking five to 12, 15 year horizons. We are not going to be in a happy place, most likely in the next three or four years. There's going to be some sort of a, of a hiccup. So if you want to be a long-term investor, I think you can be excited about a little bit of a dip because that actually could be a buying opportunity, as Jeremy pointed out. If it goes back to what's been happening lately, in my opinion, I think the, the, the Fed, first of all, reducing by half a percent as of today, um, which I believe we're at the 3rd of March when we're recording this, I think it tells you a lot about what we don't know more than it tells you about what we do. Anytime that the Fed makes such a drastic move without any sort of heads up, I think you can bet that there's a lot of, of data that people are uh, knowing that we don't know as the general public that we're going to find out later. And so there is some cause for concern. The other thing I will tell you is that, you know, I've been through two recessions. One, I was a tech, uh, uh, tech guy during the 2001 bubble burst. That was really a technology driven bust. Um, if you remember, there was just a bunch of internet stocks that went belly up, you know, these things have impact on jobs. That's the biggest thing that happens. People lose their jobs when these things happen. And when you lose your jobs, if you've got multifamily real estate, that means people are going to have trouble paying rent. So there is a cascading effect. Real estate is not immune from a downturn. It just might be a little bit of a tail end effect. But the other thing is, most definitely from the coronavirus, which we know is, is happening and we know that that's the big thing in the news lately. There has been a lot of significant impacts if you're, a, especially if you're a technology person and plugged in. There's a lot of factories that are completely shut down in China. Some that are starting to ramp back up, but they're they're doing it slowly. And it was a big shock to the system. So there is going to be nine months to a year of impact in terms of supply uh, coming into the states uh, for all this uh, technology that people are buying. And so inevitably, that's going to have down downhill effects uh, on the local market here. There might be smaller players and bigger players that are going to have to lay off some people because they can't produce the product even if they wanted to. So really, in my opinion, this just 
speaks to the fact that I think you use the word poly flashing yellow light. Right now we're in a flashing yellow. You want to be really careful about what investments you're making and you really want to keep a focus on going long and not short. Make sure that you've got a long, healthy horizon and you're taking as minimal amount of risk as you can getting into these deals. So um, really, Polly, that's where my head's at right now. Well, that sounds great. Let's talk to uh, Jeremy a little bit about uh, uh, being a passive investor. If you had a hundred thousand dollars these days, are you, what are you, what are you sticking that in in terms of real estate? Uh, warehouses, multifamily, office, and you're kind of diversified. So tell me a little bit about what you're thinking and why. Yeah, great question. So the reality is that I'll actually look at anything that I quote unquote say makes sense. Uh, that has a very different meaning today than it may have had five years ago. Um, but if you have to ask me, let's say my favorite asset classes for the next 10 years as of today, is for me, it's all about predictability. When I invest, I go into stuff that's stabilized, may or may not have some value at upside that's optional, might be 80 to 100% occupied going in because I got into all this for predictability of cash flow back in 2002, JC, right after the dot-com crash you were talking about, right? So, and that's actually why I got out of the stock market, the lack of predictability. So that's, you know, there's a thousand ways to invest, none of them are wrong, but that's what I do. So when you think about that, what I consider kind of my, my tier A asset classes for the next 10 years for predictability would be multifamily, mobile home parks, self-storage, and senior living. Now, I'm not saying that the random deal in any of those asset classes makes sense today necessarily for a lot of reasons, but if you ask me my favorite asset classes for the next 10 years based on the type of investing I do, it's those four based on kind of longer term predictability. Um, and so what I'm trying to do is find kind of unique pricing right now. And, and as you guys know, it's very hard to invest right now because asset price is very high, but deals do come along once in a while, right? And if you look hard enough, you'll find the diamond in the rough. So you have to put even that much more work right now and trying to find what makes sense. And when you do, you still move forward in it but you've got to make sure you're getting in at the right price to protect, to protect yourself, get some padding in there. And especially with the strategy that I use where you're not really adding much value add. So I can't count on adding additional padding. So I've got to be really careful on the buy. Um, and so those are my tier A asset classes. I'll look at any other asset class probably except for hotels that can make sense in general, but those are my top four for now. Well, Jeremy, it's, it's great. I mean, I, I really love where you're going with this. So let's, let's put ourselves in, a typical listener's shoes, right? So right now they're out there somewhere and, and they're, they're, they've got $100,000, like Polly said, it's, it's hard earned money. And they're looking at a multifamily uh, investment opportunity. Um, and you know, it looks good on paper and, and, and they're thinking that they're gonna pull the trigger. If you're that person, Jeremy, what are the things that you're gonna do to that deal before you make a move? Yeah. Great question. So keep in mind, again, with the profile that I have of a more stabilized opportunity, you got to keep that in mind because it could be different if it's value add, et cetera. But for me, the first thing I'm going to do is, is take a look at the cap rate. Uh, I'm going to take a look at the in-place cap rate, the trailing cap rate, probably like a T minus 12 and determine, okay, what multiple are we paying here? Because I'm looking for unique pricing today, right? And I'm not really counting on much value add. So the argument can't be we're going to add all this value so we can buy it at this price today, which is actually I think a lot of what makes sense and what pencils today is more value add, you know, from a realistic scenario. But for what I look for, that's the first thing I'm going to do. And if I don't have a uniquely well-priced asset that has a lot of padding on how we're buying it, that's going to be a challenge for me. If I see like a market rate deal or even a close to market rate deal, I'm just going to pass because I'm the kind of guy that I'm going to wait for an eventual adjustment that's going to happen once we have a downturn. And so that, that's my strategy. That's number one. Um, from there, I'll take a look at the actual cash flows. Um, you know, this is a challenging thing for me to discuss because I've kept my cash flow targets the same throughout the entire cycle. And what that's allowed me to do is actually shift away from asset classes when they got too expensive for my own cash flow targets and continue with the others. And so for me, the challenge became that the last bastion of what I thought was still okay was like back at the end of 2016. And then since then, it's all been unique pricing, et cetera, for me to be more defensive hopefully exiting some of the properties to lock in some of the lower cap rates that we were seeing at the time. And so that's kind of been my mindset, uh, mindset and mind shift since then. So from a cash flow perspective, I'll tell you, I mean, you guys are going to think this is ridiculous, but my targets, which were working early in the cycle, no problem, even mid cycle were for, let's say a class B apartment building and it's say a, a B market or a minus market um, would have been 9% cash on cash projected net to investors year one with an 8% pref as a structure. 
And then 11% uh, average annualized cash on cash for projected net to investors. And by the way, none of this was happening because there was like a 10 year interest only loan, right? I mean, it was like a properly amortizing loan. I remember in 2013, I invested in a deal actually in Texas in um, Mesquite, which is outside of Dallas. Uh, we bought it. It was a little unusual. It was a bit of a partner dispute, but we got it like a 9.1 cap on a class B 1980s garden style two-story apartment that was 97% occupied. It was a bit of a value add deal and we rehabbed all the units, but the point was the cap rate and that was an unusual cap rate back then. It probably should have been an eight. Okay. Call it. We, it's hard to even picture an eight these days. Right. But <laughs> so that's how I kind of position myself through a cycle. What I'm going to do is once a cycle ends, I'm going to reset my cap rate targets and my cash flow targets depending on how the market changes, but I have to wait to see what happens with that. So in the meantime, I'm trying to keep to those targets. What I come off of a little bit right now, maybe especially for year one, but you can be sure I probably wouldn't go below 8% cash on cash projected year one. And maybe I won't go below a 10 year, 10% 10 average cash on cash return because the way that I work is that without that additional padding coming in, I've always got to be careful about the price and keeping the same targets throughout the entire cycle keeps me out of trouble. Um, it's not, it's basically keeps me out of saying, okay, I'm going to adjust because the price is getting more and more and more expensive. I'll just adjust that. That's not the way that I work. And so it causes a bit of a frustration at this point in the cycle when I can't find much, but that's how I try to protect myself on the downside. So tell me, you know, it's been uh, gum, gum drops and lollipops and, <laughs> chocolate chip cookies for the last couple of years. Yes. Now we may have a black swan event coming up right now. Uh, but uh, is there been an investment that you in, invested in that either went sideways or down? And why did it do that? Yeah. Um, are you referring to in the last couple of years or you're just saying yeah. in general? Um, in the last couple of years, um, I've made very relatively few investments in the last couple of years. So I'm trying to think if anything go bad in the last couple of years. I definitely have examples I can share with you from before then, but. Oh yeah. Beforehand, you know, a lot of people that, that haven't invested ever in real estate are kind of looking for the, uh, the gotchas. And yeah. What are, what as a passive investor has it been that, uh, the, the general partner has gotcha. I have a great story. If it's okay, I'll take a minute or two. Oh, sure. we, we love it. Please. Very Stories unique. are good. Really unique. Uh, a lot of lessons. So really good story. So 2008, January, I am convinced we're going to have a downturn. Okay. And so I'm looking at what can I invest in? And I take a look at the Serena unit student housing apartment building in Michigan. First property across from a state university campus. And my thesis at the time was, well, people tend to go back to school during a downturn. This is probably going to fare pretty well. And it's in a great location. And the operators are 17th property. Okay. So, uh, and in fact, most of what they have done, yeah, right. Check boxes. So most of what they have done, in fact, they own themselves. They're pretty high net worth as well. They hadn't syndicated that much yet. Long story short is that I invested in this deal at the beginning of 2008. And the catch was that it had an assumable loan for, I think it was four or five years. Okay. Which actually made it a, a really good deal. Go in. It's 100% occupied year one, year two, year three, no problem. Beginning of, I think it was 2012, um, our loan is due in the fall to refi. And we get a letter and all the tenants get a letter from the city saying, um, sorry, the bridge to campus has to be closed for repairs during the summer months because that's when we have to repair the bridge, right? That like the warm weather. But don't worry, we're going to be open. It's going to be ready and open for school year, right? So we go from 100% occupied to 65% occupied. Now uh -huh. that would have been manageable for a year, right? But the loan was due in the fall and the bank was not willing to extend the loan for a year. And I think that's because they wanted the property back, right? Cause it was kind of obvious. So um, it's actually the only foreclosure I've ever been in. And what happened is that um, couldn't get the refi. Uh, the syndicator actually lost partial recourse, lost their money. But what's really amazing is that they actually took everyone's equity. They felt really bad, took everyone's equity and transferred it to another property they own themselves, a first property across from another state university. In fact, in fact it's San Marcos, Texas. That's where I am today. So it took about a year to get transferred. There was tax issues and all this stuff, no cash flow for a year. They transferred us, and now I continue to cash flow on that deal. So in fact, the only foreclosure I've ever been in didn't even result in me really total loss, right? So, um, but... There are a ton of good lessons there that we can unpack if you want, but I always tell everybody, look, I can tell you 20 ways any deal can go bad 
at any time. I don't care how stabilized it is. Like when you're going into it, there are so many scenarios that can take place and you're not even thinking about. And they're all these what I call 1% risks. And that's why diversification is so key. And um, that just continues on to my philosophy today because there are so many unforeseen things that can happen that you would just, there's no way to forecast. You know, you're, you're a passive investor. How many times or how much communication do you have with the general partner? Is it uh, once a month when his report or her report comes out to you? Are you proactive to kind of figure out what's going on? And, and when do you feel you become too much of a pain in the ass to the general <laughs> partner who says, uh, you're fired? Yeah, I'm in a bit of a unique position. So it's not a fully fair question to ask me because I have my own investor group and I don't want to get into that on the podcast. But the point is that I have, I probably will, it will take me longer before they just completely cut me off as far as asking questions. But I tend to be very proactive. Um, I probably on average speak to most of my, either speak to your email, most of the sponsors every month or two, some more frequently than that. Um, I'm used to getting quarterly reports though. So what really makes me a pain in the ass is I'll try to keep on top of what's going on in between reports, not just reacting to a report, for example. That being said, I do take kind of a hands-off approach in that my philosophy is that if something is within 20 or 25%, let's say 20% of projected cash flow, then I'm totally fine with it, right? A projection is a projecting. No one's ever going to hit an exact you know, decimal point projection on anything in eight years out. But if something is going wrong and I don't understand why it's going wrong, I will dig very deep into it. So I'm more concerned. And you got to remember, I'm going into a deal that's already stabilized, right? So you know, if you're thinking of like that deal going bad, there's a lot more dominoes that have to fall versus a value add deal. And a value add deal, one, two, three dominoes can fall. There's going to have to be five or six. So I already have an advantage going into what I invest in. And therefore, I don't deal with as much headache as maybe some other people and very variability and stuff. Because again, I'm trying to invest for predictability. So thankfully, I don't deal with that much of a headache in general, and I try to give some leeway as far as the actual cash flows versus projected, but I'll definitely dig in if need be, if, if something isn't on track. You know, Jeremy, your, your information and your, your knowledge base is just so, so incredibly deep. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about as, as you were talking is, I think I heard you say a sponsor or operator, you know, probably more than 10 times. And so if you're an investor out there, let's put yourself again in their shoes and, and, and they've got this amount of money that they're going to hunk down into a deal. You know, really, you know, in my opinion, right, I always like to say is you don't invest in companies, you invest in people. And I think that, you know, multifamily syndications are no different. Um, one of the things that I enjoy about multifamily is that, you know, we control the deal as, as operators, as syndicators, you know, you put your hard earned money in the stock market, you don't really know what's going on behind the scenes with the big board at a big company and who's doing what and what political motivations and whatnot may be going on. But with these deals, you can actually get a chance to get to know the actual operators, the owners that are putting these deals together, the syndication uh, sponsors themselves. You can, you can talk to them and see what the, where their head's at. Jeremy, when, when, when you're going to make an investment, it's easy if you've worked with a sponsor for you know, five deals and they've, they've executed well. But when you're going in with a completely new sponsor that you've never worked with before, um, what are you doing to kick the tires on those people themselves, right? Great question. And um, the, I start off from a, a, being a lucky point, I call it, because I tend to be very detailed as a person. So that's really helpful for me because what that allows me to do is end up asking questions without even meaning to ask questions, meaning that just my personality, right? So asking a lot of questions can be very helpful. I think the first thing I'll tell you is that uh, I'm really glad, glad you brought this topic up because, you know, not everybody will agree with this, but I think that who you're making the bet on is even more important than the property itself, the analysis of the property. And I think the property is a very close second. I don't want to like tell anybody the property isn't important, but I do think who you're making a bet on is ultimately important. And I frankly think that the example I gave to everybody before of the foreclosure that I was in was actually a great example of why I got lucky making a bet on the right person in that particular circumstance. Right. And so um, it just, and it, it but who you're making a bet on is much more, it's important for so many more reasons than that example. Um, and so I, the best way to describe what I try to do is when I get a, um, a, a business plan, executive summary, overview, whatever you want to call it, I try to read between the lines. And I really am trying to find people who are conservative, looking to under promise and over deliver to maintain long term relations with investors. I'm trying to avoid people who are making the numbers look good and using more aggressive assumptions to kind of attract investors and have a nice marketing piece, 
who may overpromise and underdeliver, but doesn't really care because they're going to go move on with their marketing machine to find somebody else as another investor. And so when you think of it from that high level, I'm trying to read between the lines and see what are the, what do the numbers tell me about whether this person's conservative or not? And what do their responses tell me when I ask questions about whether they're conservative or not? So, um, and let me get into that second piece because the numbers are fairly obvious. You can look at assumptions on revenue increases, expense increases, and all different things, right? And cap rate assumptions on the exit and all these kind of more obvious things. But, you know, I may ask questions sometimes where I don't even care what the answer is, but how they answer it is what I'm trying to look for in terms of what they're telling me and what their personality is. So I'm going to give you a quick example. Hopefully this will make sense to everybody who's listening. So let's say that I find someone who, um, uh, use an 8% uh, vacancy factor in a market where the property is 100% occupied. And I say, well, why did you do that? What I'm looking for the answer to is, well, we actually think it's going to be between 97 and 100% occupied going forward based on what we've seen, but we used 8% to try to be conservative because we want you guys to have realistic projections, right? That's a checkbox, right? The, the Paul checkbox that we had before. Um, and whereas if, if I hear, well, I'm looking at a property in Austin. I'm, I don't know why I'm even using Austin. It's been a hot market. So I'm looking at a property in Austin and you know, it's been growing at, Austin's been growing at X percent per year, call it just for this example, five, seven. I don't know what the real number is. And so this person projects out that revenue, the actual rents are gonna go up 5% or 7% for the next five years and maybe taper off at like 5% or 4% thereafter. And I say to them, well, why did you use these assumptions? That seems very high. You know, if the answer is, well, this is a hot market, we've done all the research, it's going to continue to be a hot market for the foreseeable future, we think this is realistic, right? That would make me want to walk away um, from a deal. And that's all in terms of how the person responded to their mindset as opposed to necessarily what the data is telling you. So um, in other words, that person could be right. It could be that that market's a hot market and may continue on, but it's not the conservative approach. So I think that that's a really, really important fundamental approach to take. And it can kind of like trickle into everything and how you're analyzing everything in your mindset about how you go about trying to figure out who to make a bet on. I think that's a, that's a very important point. Um, you know, kind of a pro, pro point is that when we approve a loan, we look at, uh, a, we call it the kind of five C's of making a, a decision. You know, collateral, what kind of collateral is, what kind of capital the capacity to pay back. And one thing we're, we're looking for is, is character. What is the character of the person that's borrowing the money from us to make, to make sure that we're all on the same page, that we understand that uh, we have a partner because we're putting up 70, 80% of the money and the, uh, the investors are putting up say 20 or 25% of the money. We want to make sure that uh, we understand what their character is like. And so uh, I would tell you that well, some people, some some investment groups, the general partners have gotten very aggressive in some of their uh, pro formas to the point that a, a management company that I, I spoke with told me that they had to lock down their pro formas <laughs> and put a, a, a watermark through it, oh, making geez. sure that they didn't give it to somebody, that they started <laughs> to put their own numbers in and it said their name on it, thinking that they had approved and we're able to stand behind those numbers and they weren't so you know they took these they took these raw numbers of what the property management uh group was able to do it for revised it to their numbers and then put push it into the the ppm and that that's the wrong uh character to have also to just remember when, when your group applies for a mortgage uh, we may pull credit reports on you but one of the biggest things that we pull the things called UCCs on the K, the KPs, the, the key principles in the deal. And we pull it, which is kind of like a credit check to kind of figure out there's any like open judgments, bankruptcies, fraud, anything that, that is uh, a crime against you, against the, uh, against the sponsor. Uh, we give that to, we have to have that. So maybe the uh, KP, We'll have that and be able to give that to you if you're a limited partner to show and prove up in that county that there's no, he has no judgments or bankruptcies uh, that would affect his capacity to repay and his character to do it on a timely basis. Yeah, I have a bonus bonus tip to add to that, Paul, which is um, what I do because I run background checks. And actually, I'm glad you brought this topic up because I, ha I have to say, I mean, I talked to thousands of investors and I'm not even exaggerating that number. And 
it is a very small percentage of investors, unfortunately, who run background checks. And it actually saved me several times. And what I love doing, and this is, again, kind of reading between the lines, is I'll say, I'll go up to sponsor and say, look, um, I need your name, date of birth, and home address to run background checks. I need on each of the managing members, for example. And before I run it on anybody, uh, I just like to know, is there anything I should know before I run it? Because in all fairness, I've actually seen situations where um, someone had a really good explanation for something that's going to look really bad up front. And then you have to kind of weigh, okay, do you believe them? Is this reasonable or not? But at least give them a chance. But, but I've seen situations too. I had an investor call me. It was about a month ago and said, look, I asked them that question. Is there anything I should know? They didn't tell me anything around the check. They had a bankruptcy, but it was like in 2000, whatever, right? It was more than seven years ago. And I think that some, some of the people who you're running these on assume that it's wiped off and that they won't, people won't see it because it's been more than seven years and therefore it doesn't really affect their credit, but it doesn't mean it's not on their history. So, you know, the investor said to me, what should I do? Because I didn't mention it. And I said, well, there's so many deals out there. You don't really know why they didn't tell you, but the point is why take the risk, right? So it's another, the, my bonus tip is to give people that option to actually tell you in advance because that tells you something about their character, that character word. Um, and then yeah. evaluate it from there as well. So I think some, sometimes people invest or you see opportunities from other people from outside their area or their, their center of influence. There may be a deal that comes in from Arizona, from a sponsorship group in Arizona, and you live in Philadelphia or you know, the vice versa, something like that. So you really don't know these people, so you have no idea what has been done or uh, you know, what these guys are. And if you don't know them real well, then this, you know, they just happen to get your email address and they push this opportunity. You're looking at, and this is, this is pretty damn good. I'm going to get into it. I will tell you another pro tip. I, I go on to uh, FBI and SEC's websites in those areas to find out if I'm going to see a name that may be familiar to the person that's actually uh, uh, trying to raise money. So uh, that, that's probably the first thing I do. I, I just do a, a, a Google search for one and then go get into it a little bit. SEC and then the state uh, uh, securities groups and then the FBI to figure out that this person's out there that you don't know that may be have some trouble in the past. I Gosh. remember I got lucky because, uh, well, not lucky, but I, I used to hire a PI before I got access to the direct um, background check software. I used to actually pay a PI to run it for me and they basically use the same uh, database. I remember, God, it was a long time ago, probably somewhere between 2002 and 2005. Uh, ran a check on somebody and I remember he had it was so obvious like he had about 20 lawsuits from individuals okay and then from one state and then he would move to another state and then he'd have like another 15 from another state right because he do local investing and then he moved to another state it was so obvious what had been going on but had I not run that background check I probably would have lost tens of thousands of dollars right so for those of you who are listening please run a background check or pay a PI to run a background check because it can really save you. And it's really not that expensive, relatively speaking. You know, I, I just can't tell you how valuable these tips are. And, you know, and to us, it seems obvious because we're here and we've been doing this for so long, but for somebody out there that's listening, just to hear that tip to run a background check, which, which I've been doing this for 14 plus years, I, I have maybe a handful of people that have actually like taken my advice and run it and run a criminal background check on myself uh, and my principal partner. And obviously we're squeaky clean, but you got to do it. You have to do it every single time. It is not worth risking hundreds of thousands of dollars in these investments. Another tip, pro tip that I will give uh, our listeners out there is, and I love Jeremy, what you said about how the sponsor answers the question when you ask the question, not necessarily what the answer is, but how they answer. One thing I can tell you is, you know, ask a sponsor about a deal that's gone bad. Hey, can you tell me about a deal that hasn't performed to where you, you've expected it to perform? Tell me why that happened and tell me what you did to recover. And then let them tell you about a deal gone wrong because everybody can talk till they're blue in the face about deals that have gone good. And we all like to pump our chest up. But get somebody to talk about a deal that hasn't gone bad and what they did to turn the ship around if they were able to. And really listen to the way that they explain how they managed out of the difficult situation. That is going to really, I think, be a telltale sign of whether these folks are people that you should be working with or if they shouldn't, right? Yeah, and I also be very cautious about using someone's um, historical, uh, you know, deal um, performance, sorry. Okay. Um, as if, if, if someone hasn't been through a cycle, that's very dangerous because 
you know, I tell people like you would, you can invest. I, I live here in LA. I'm a few blocks away from Beverly Hills and you can invest like the best building in the best location on Rodeo drive in 2007 and been with the best operator and been foreclosed in 2010. And you can invest it in the worst up like location with the worst operator and the worst property in 2007 and, and the 10 and exited in 2017 and made a boatload of money. So you have to be very cautious about looking at, at those historical returns and really make sure you understand when they were achieved and what the market conditions were. Yeah. Well, well, Jeremy, gosh, I mean, we could, we could talk for literally, I could probably talk with you for hours on end. Uh, I am just fascinated with your experience and just really the way that you logically break these deals down. If, if there's somebody out there and I bet you there's going to be a lot that are uh, just really uh, impressed with the way that you think, um, how can they get a hold of you and, 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 and talk to you? Yeah, no, thanks for asking. I'm happy to talk to anybody. I'm happy to help any way that I can. If you're new or experienced, want to network, have questions, whatever, just feel free to email me. That's definitely the best way to reach me. Uh, my email is jroll, J-R-O-L-L, at Roll Investments, R-O-L-L Investments with an S, dot com. So jroll at rollinvestments.com. So you can imagine the reason why uh, the crowd was totally into Jeremy talking up on stage because he, he gives great factual information about what's going on, how to protect you, your investment, your retirement, your parents' money. You know, that's, that's the big thing is, is making sure that uh, you are a fiduciary for, and doing the right things for, your, for, your, for the money that's out there. So Jeremy, some great information. Uh, JC, if somebody wanted to know a little bit more about what you guys do or what you do uh, for multifamily, what's the best way to get a hold of you for one? And again, what the heck do you do? <laughs> what do we do? Well, you know, Polly, we started this show because we just love to help people. Really, honestly, at the end of the day, we love to help people make smart multifamily investments. We're not going to talk to you about bread makers. Uh, we don't know how to invest in the stock market that well. But one thing we do know how to do is invest in multifamily. So if there's anybody out there that has questions about getting started in multifamily and they're wondering where to turn, uh, we offer a free 50-minute consultation and introduction with myself, uh, if you so desire, uh, where I'll spend 50 minutes uh, asking you uh, what you're trying to accomplish and, and giving you some, some real experience that's you know 14 plus years of experience in this business and try to help you out and give you a good head start on where you need to go. Uh, with uh, with your multifamily uh, investment uh, uh, desires. Um, so you can go to our website, multifamilypropertygroup.com. Again, multifamilypropertygroup.com. Go to the contact us page and just request a 50-minute consultation. And I would be happy to set up a Zoom meeting and see how I can help you out. Polly, what about you on your side? What if, what if people are looking to uh, put loans on these properties? What's, what's your deal, Polly? <laughs> So our deal, we're, um, we're one of the, the largest and most active multifamily lenders in the United States. So go to oldcapitallending.com. If you want to listen to our podcast, the Old Capital Podcast, which is downloaded 50,000 times a month, uh, we give a lot of good information similar to this without the video, but uh, some great information. Go to the Old Capital Podcast. And on that, you can download our 19-page white paper report on, on multifamily. 101 would we'll get a little bit more uh, behind the scenes about how to get approved for an apartment loan, what's important, kind of know the checklist of what uh, you need to do to develop a best friend relationship with your lender, because we're going to invest in your deal and we want, kind of want to understand how that all works. So uh, contest, contact us at Old Capital Podcast or Old Capital Multi or Old Capital Lending. So uh, Jeremy, a pleasure. Thank you. I wish you, you know, all the success in the future and you're doing great in the past. So uh, I know you'll do, do well going forward. So uh, contact Jeremy, but uh, don't uh, over contact Jeremy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> uh, who, anybody's listening to this. There's a lot of great uh, things that Jeremy's done, whether it's been podcasting or YouTube. Look him up uh, in that uh, you'll get a lot of your information from uh, other podcasts that Jeremy's been on. So we certainly appreciate uh, him being on the show. So Jeremy, thank you. JC, thank you. I'm Paul Peebles. Have a great day.